So very warm welcome to everyone. Today we have a um, very special speaker with us all the way from the Caribbean, you know, from a little place called St. Martin. We have Sister Devki. And um, Sister Devki has been uh, practicing this meditation, Raj Yoga, for about 37 years. Wow. And so that's a long time, really, to be exploring, you know, different methods and having different experiences, the spiritual study. So long, beautiful journey. And uh, she has traveled and lived in many different countries and would spend, I think, most of the time in the Caribbean, uh, teaching and studying Raj Yoga with the Brahma Kumaris. So she's going to speak on the topic, who owns my mind? You know? And so we might think, well, the answer is quite obvious, but maybe it's not that obvious. You know? And so a very warm welcome to Sister Devki. And um, the, just to remind you, the session is being recorded. And so we will finish by two o'clock. So thank you, Sister Devaki. So from my end, let me say good morning. I know it's afternoon in your end, but it is good morning from this end. And I want to send you some sunshine because we have loads of it in this part of the world. I know how your weather can be very interesting because I also once lived in that vicinity in the UK, that's when I met Radha. She was quite a young lady. She's still pretty young, I know that for sure. And yes, uh, today's topic is who owns my mind? And what do I mean when I ask this question, who owns my mind? Is that when we allow people to live in our mind 24 seven. And we do that sometimes. Someone is living in my mind. I can't forget them. Even when I try to sleep in my waking hours, as well as in my sleep, I keep having those people or person in my mind. It could be also a situation something that happened, traumatic situation. And I keep replaying that scene in my mind again and again. I recall a lady who came to visit me with her husband. And uh, she was telling me uh, that my family doesn't love me. That's why she's seeking meditation. I said, how did you come to that conclusion? So she told a story how her sister and mom had an argument with her and they said not so nice things to her. And the way she was describing it, it was as if it was just recent. But as the, she continued in the conversation with me, I came to learn that it was 28 years ago. Her sister and her mom had a confrontation with her and they said some things that is not usual for close family members to say to each other, but they did. And though I understand her hurt, it's typical that you didn't expect that from your family and so you feel disturbed. 
So I did ask her, how long did the conversation last? And she said, roughly an hour. So they apparently from her perspective, and I say from her perspective, they hurt her. But she's been carrying that hurt for 28 years and repeating it again and again, sharing that hurt. So she kept that pain and that hurt alive for 28 years. So then I ask her, your family may be responsible for saying those not so nice things to you. And that scene lasts for one hour. But you have kept that scene as a playback music in your subconscious mind. You use that as your playback mantra again and again and again. So they hurt you for one hour. How much did you hurt yourself in those 28 years? And in that context, I asked the question, who owns my mind? If I choose, and by now it's not rocket science, to understand that no one, absolutely no one can insult me, disrespect me, and hurt me emotionally or otherwise, unless I give them permission to do that. Unless I, allow them to enter the sacred space called my mind. It is my most sacred space. And therefore I should take care of that sacred space. I should have a safety mechanism, a safety lock, a security key, so that not anyone and everyone and any individual or any event or circumstances have the, the keys, the numbers of that key or the code to enter my sacred space. So do we all take responsibility to ensure that we don't give those code to anyone and everyone, or do we give it away easily? And that's my responsibility. So when I say, who owns my mind? I mean, do you choose to allow people to enter your sacred space and disturb you? And do you make that part of your routine that you allow people all the time to disturb your sacred space? And the one who you allow to disturb your sacred space, that one owns your freedom and that one owns your happiness as well as your peace. So what do you get in return? You become a victim. You choose to be a victim and you give somebody away your freedom. And that's fine if you don't realize that. But when you realize that somebody is owning your 
freedom, you should take back your freedom. Because you're the one and only you, absolutely only you, who create the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that you experience any hour of the day or night. You create those thoughts. Nobody put thoughts in your head. You create the thoughts and based on the thoughts you create, there are certain emotions and feelings that becomes part of your mind if you allow. So you think negative and you see a situation in a negative way, it creates certain emotions and feelings. But it starts with thought. You think it's negative. It arouses negative feelings and emotions. And you choose to create those thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And you can change it. You have the power to do both, to make yourself a victim, but also the power to make yourself a victor. What do you choose to do? What do you choose to do? You decide. You want to be a victor, you want to be a victim, and it's not in anyone else's hand. Nothing from the outside, nothing from the outside can enter your sacred space unless you give permission. So your feelings, pain, happiness, peacelessness, peace are your own making. And the earlier we recognize this, it's the earlier we're going to take back our own power. It belongs to us. I want to give another example. There was a young lady and her mom who came to visit the center, wanted to learn meditation. And there was a, a number of other individuals in the group. So at some point I asked everyone just to give an idea why they want to meditate. And when it came to the young lady, she said, I want to learn meditation because I get angry a lot. So curiously, I asked, what makes you angry? And then she described that she lived in an apartment block and there's a neighbor next door who owns a dog. And that dog will come in her garden, her porch and mess it up. And she made some attempt to talk to the owner, but nothing seems to work. But what was interesting is, was that when she was describing the scene, she was getting very hyper. I can see she was getting very disturbed as she was relating the story. So I said, you know, at this moment, you sound like a victim. And she said, no, I'm not a victim. It's the lady and her dog. And I said, are you sure you're not sending negative vibration to both? And they are reacting to them and they are not cooperating with you? Again, she was in total denial. She said, no, 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 it's not me. It's not, it's the neighbor, it's her dog. So finally, I said, I'm going to make one more comment and then we'll move on. So I asked her, what if in the morning you wake up tomorrow morning and discover your neighbor and their dog, they had moved out. They had moved out from the apartment next door. Does that mean that as of tomorrow, you'll never ever get angry again? And you all know the answer, right? 
she looked at me rather for a moment taken aback, of course. Then she started to laugh and she said, yes, I'll get angry. I said, why? Apparently, your source of anger, and that's what you think, is the dog and the neighbor, and they're out of the way. What will make you angry? And that's when she, she admitted that you made me to realize that the anger is inside. So many times when our mind get disturbed, we tend to blame the event, the situation, the individuals related. And unless and until we recognize that people, circumstances, situation can act as triggers, but they are never the source neither of your happiness or your unhappiness. Source of your happiness or unhappiness is you, yourself. A circumstance, a situation, an event, someone can provoke the situation. But if there's no anger, nothing can be provoked. I want to give another example, very practical example. If you're invited to your friend's house and because she's your friend or you are her friend, what usually happen? You trust your friend in your house. So your friend, kept her wallet on the table. And you could see that the wallet is quite big, must be having lots of money inside maybe. And you are having the habit of stealing, sticky fingers. And you needed money at that time. And you think, what if I take some money from my friend's wallet and I'm going to get it back at some point? She probably wouldn't even, she probably wouldn't even know that it has gone missing. So you take the wallet and you can justify one, that you needed money and two, it was her responsibility. She should not have kept the wallet where she kept it. But let's change the scene. That's scene number one. And scene number two. You're invited to the same house by the same friend and the wallet is right where it was in the scene number one. But in the second scene, you never steal. It's not your habit. Would you be tempted to take the wallet if you, are, you don't steal? You don't have the habit of stealing? No. So what makes you take the money in the first place, scene number one, as opposed to scene number two? Is it your friend's fault? Is it the circumstances at that time you, you need money? So we have to recognize what are triggers and how they work and what is my responsibility. The two go hand in hand, trigger, responsibility. I either use something to trigger me and blame that thing or that person, or I take responsibility and stop the blame game. So if I understand, my responsibility in all of that. In this meditation that is being taught by this organization, we talked about 
I, the being, when we make the reference that I'm human being, the human aspect of us is the body and the being aspect is the soul, the spirit, the living entity, the conscious being inside of the body. So I don't have a soul. I am a soul, but I have a body which I use to play a variety of roles. But I am separate from my body and from the roles I play. So nobody can play the role of a husband unless they have a wife. Nobody can play the role of a father unless they have a child. Nobody can play the role of a boss if they don't have employees. So you play those roles, but you're not those roles. Who are you? I am a soul, a being of light, seated in the center of my body. And as a soul, I have eight faculties. Three of them are subtle, cannot be seen because they're related to the soul. And there are five faculties which can be seen because they're related to the body. So the three faculties of the soul is mind, intellect, and personality traits. So we all have a mind. And what we use that mind to do is to create thoughts. And based on those thoughts, feelings and emotions are triggered. So let's say I'm thirsty and I am thinking what to drink. Considering the weather is warm, I will say maybe I should have something cold or the reverse. So once I decide, first I think what I'm going to drink and then I'm going, that's when I use the mind, the first faculty. And then the second faculty is what we call the intellect, the ability to make choices. So having thought through the options of what is available for drinking, then I have to decide what I will finally drink. So that's where the intellect plays a part. And having decided what to drink, that's when I engage my physical organ, my legs to take me to the fridge, my hands to acquire the drink, and I do the act of drinking. So first step that I'm totally responsible for is the thinking process. Second step is the deciding process. And the third step is acting process. And all of them are in my hands and only in my hands, nobody else's hand. So having drank whatever I choose to drink, every action leaves an impression. So let's say I choose my favorite passion fruit punch. So I choose passion fruit punch. And when I tasted it, I like it. So I'm recording in my subconscious mind that impression of what it feels or tastes like drinking passion fruit punch. And that is going to record and stay as an impression or a memory within my own mind. After a few days, I'm in the same spot. I'm getting the symptoms of thirst and I think I should drink something. 
again, I look through my fridge to see what's available. And I see there's still some more passion fruit punch remaining. So I take the decision to drink again, passion fruit punch. So each time I repeat an action, it deepens my impression. And sooner than we imagine, we create a habit. And what's the habit? Drinking passion fruit punch. Now, look at your personality and you will discover that you have a set of habits. Like what spices you like to prepare your meals with? What is your favorite color? What is your favorite pastime? What movies that you prefer to watch? What sports you enjoy participating in? Put all your habits together, you form your personality. Usually, it's not challenging to relate thoughts. Like we know we create thoughts. We know that already. It's an established fact that we create thoughts with our mind. And we know it's almost an established fact that watch your thoughts, they can become words. We know that, we're comfortable with that. Watch your words, they become action. I think we are familiar with that also and we take responsibility somewhat for that. Watch your actions, they become habit. And by the time it gets to habit, and more so by the time it gets to personality, I start to back off. And I start to play the blame game. That my personality is as a result of my upbringing. My personality is because I didn't get formal education. My personality is because the government does not do enough for people like me. So by the time we recognize that we have a personality and part of that personality makes me unhappy. Whilst some part of the personality I learned to live with so by the time we get to this point of recognizing if we ever do, and we do eventually, most of us, that there's a deep connection between my personality and my destiny. Am I ready to take that plunge? and to take full responsibility for my tomorrow, knowing that my tomorrow is deeply connected with the thoughts, choices, actions that I am creating today. If I can do that, I can recognize the deep connection between my yesterday, today, and my tomorrow. I will be taking back all the powers that I have. I have humongous power to choose what destiny I want. I have the power. It's not in anyone else's hand. And I can take that power 
and decide what I want my tomorrow to be like. Yes, I hope I am not taking too much time. Rather, you just let me know when I should stop. No, yeah, you're going fine. We're, okay. Uh, maybe a, you can also do a meditation in between. That's fine too. So. I will another... leave the meditation for you. What about you doing the little bit meditation? In... <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. So, so how much have, time more uh, we have? Just to give me a little sense of. Uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes. Okay. In that we can do like 10 minutes of meditation? Yeah, sure. I was hoping you will do that. I do it every it time. Is... So it's nice if you do. Okay. Someone says no time limit. Yes, we do work in co the constraint of time, unfortunately. Uh, yes, because I don't want to overwhelm anyone. I'm sure this is all not new knowledge. I'm sure Radha is a good teacher and all the other presenter before me must be sharing insights. I'm just reinforcing that which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. However, coming back to this topic, who owns my mind? There's something called conscious mind and something called subconscious mind. And if we know the difference, this is where we can do a little bit homework. One is, Conscious mind is that gateway, the gateway to my subconscious mind is my conscious mind. And let me give an example. You hear something coming from the outside. It first enter the room of your mind. And if you Play with that which you hear, <clears throat> sorry. You keep thinking again and again and again what you just heard. If you're not careful, it will soon be part of your con subconscious mind. Because every time we repeatedly think about something, go it again and again play it back in our mind we are reinforcing it and we are recording it in our subconscious mind it's like you hear about someone you don't know that person but you come to hear from someone that that person is not an honest person you have not met the person, you don't know the person personally, but you have heard that that person is not honest. And you start imagining, and you start thinking over what you heard. And you keep your mind occupied all day long, remembering what you heard. And now it's going to go as part of your subconscious mind. And if by chance you ever meet that person, the person who you hear is not honest, the moment you come face to face with that person, you're going to pull from your subconscious mind your perception of that person. And based on your perception, how are you going to treat that person? what filter you are going to use, what lens you're going to wear. You're going to wear the lens of seeing the person as a dishonest person. And you're going to treat that person with that attitude. See how what comes in our conscious mind 
ultimately become part of our subconscious mind. And so before it gets to your subconscious mind, you have to catch it and stop it. First of all, stop it from entering your mind. And if it do enter your mind, you have to have a mechanism. How do I deal now that I've heard that? What I have heard, how do I process it? It's like, I'm going to give you an example. You have an outfit and you expect people to like that outfit. And you go, go to work in your new outfit and you expect some compliments because you feel so good in the outfit. But they say, I quite, I, someone, the first person says to you, I don't like that outfit. It doesn't suit you. Now, you could simply say that person is, that person doesn't like me. That person is disrespecting me. But in reality, it's your expectation from that person and because the person didn't do what you expect that expectation brings hurt it's not what the person says but your expectation or the way you interpret what the person says the person might be totally honest they just don't like that type of outfit but you take it personally. So when you see you're getting hurt by other people's words, you just have to talk yourself into the idea that everyone is an individual in his or her own rights and their rights should be respected. And secondly, don't ever take anyone's opinion personally. That's your responsibility. Not to take anyone's opinion personally and allow people to express themselves and be comfortable to do that. But on your side, you have to protect yourself knowing that it's the opinion of someone else. It's not my opinion. And they must be allowed to express themselves. That's how I look at life. Maybe you have other mechanism that you use, but for me, I do try not to allow people opinion about me to define me. I know who I am and I'm comfortable with who I am. So that's one aspect to look at. And secondly, anything that you record in your subconscious mind, you can change those recordings, like some traumatic situation, some past hurt, some relationship that got sour, I can change that. And how I can do that? By creating affirmations. Every day, just like how you take precautions, some of you may have done that already, wear your masks, right? And practice social distancing and hand sanitization and all the works at the moment, you take precaution to stay healthy. What about taking precaution to keep your mind healthy and your heart happy? And the precaution is Take your dose of vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin 
whatever. And that is in the morning, if you can spend a few minutes when you get up, sit quietly in solitude just for a few minutes and create a positive affirmation for your well being, for yourself, a positive affirmation for your loved one a positive affirmation for your job, a positive affirmation for your country. Should we stop there? Five, four, four affirmations. You can go on, you can have five, six, seven, it's all up to you, but at least the main areas of your life, yourself, your relationship, your job and your environment, your country. So if you can create five affirmation every day and those affirmation is like taking a lift, not going through the day in the roller coaster ride. Sometimes the day goes successful, not successful, not at the mercy of circumstances and situation, but maintaining a positive attitude no matter what. And if you can arm yourself by having these positive, yes, I saw a message from someone. Thank you very much, yeah. So if you can take affirmations in the morning and keep your mind engaged in constructive and positive thoughts, then there is no space to allow anything negative to enter the sacred space of your mind. So can I stop here now? Is there anyone who may have a question or so? And this is Sudevi. I think in the chat, there's a couple of questions. Oh, wow. Um, one is, uh, so do our thoughts and actions create our destiny? And if I want something, should I tell myself that I already have it? Sorry, I, I'm missing. Can you go that over, Radha? Certainly. Um, do our thoughts and actions create our destiny? Yes. So that's one. That's the and, first question. And if I want something, should I tell myself that I already have it? So first we know that yes, thoughts and action Thought is the seed and the tree, the, the tree is action. Thought is the seed, tree is the action and fruit is the result of the action. You know, I when I was at school, my history teacher, he used to always write the thought on the board blackboard and one day he wrote this thought act is the blossom of thought and joy and suffering are its fruit i was pretty young in my maybe 10 11 years and i still remember that thought until today act act is the blossom of thought joy and suffering are its fruit so so your destiny is the byproduct of your thinking, decision, and your action. That's what your destiny adds up to. And the other question is, um, the I am in affirmation works best. I am content. 
I am grateful. I am happy. If I can have that kind of mindset, I am mindset, a grateful mindset. And when it comes to wanting something, I also like a beautiful house, a beautiful center. I like to have facilities comfort. So there's no, nothing wrong with that. But I throw it out into the universe. I would like to see this happening. But I am not depending, my happiness is not depending on the outcome of that. If I get what I want, I am, it will enhance my happiness. And if I don't get what I want, I am still happy. I hope that shows some light. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, shall we close now? Are you going to play music or should I? Um, I can play some. I can share the screen and play some music. So. Yes, and I can just share a few thoughts. I step inwards to connect with who I really am. I am a beautiful spark of light. I'm blessed to have a sacred space called mind. I love to spend time to understand what goes on in my mind. I love to be with my mind. I want to befriend my mind because my mind is in fact my best friend. I want to take my mind for a walk on the beach, just me and my mind. So I get to understand, I get to be friend. I make a deal with my mind because my mind is my closest companion and most valuable companion. I love spending time in my sacred space. I'm happy to be alone in silence, in solitude, enjoying company with this best friend. My mind is my chief minister. My mind can make me think outside of the box. 
and my mind can make me get stuck. So I want to work with my mind. I want to have an appointment with my mind at the start of the day. Just like how the CEO consult with the secretary, my mind is my secretary. I give instruction to my mind at the start of the day. And at the end of the day, I again sit with my mind and I reflect, go through with my mind what went right and what went wrong. I sort them all out. And I give a lot of love and gratefulness and thank you to my sacred space, my mind. Om Shanti. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Devki, for having shared uh, these very beautiful thoughts, really, with so much gentleness and, and really giving that sense of, of really wanting to take care of the mind. You know, this image of taking the mind for a walk and a talk, you know, it's very, very beautiful. Enjoyed that a lot. And, I see that there are some comments also. Nice reminder that my happiness is not depending on the things I get or have in life, but rather, oops. Um, but rather depending on my thoughts, words, and actions. Thank you. And uh, so we'll try to take care of my mind, sacred space. So once again, thank you, Sister Devki, and we wish you lots of continued sunshine. And uh, I think we're also very lucky in Italy that we have quite a bit of sunshine here. So okay. thank you That's everyone good to know. for participating. Thank you, everyone. Yes. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you.